morning. All right, there we go. Everybody recovered from that party last night? How about that party? Do we have a good time with you guys all out there? All right. You know, we have to thank Exonet, and again, Mark Ganzi for the sponsor. Thank you very much to Exonet for sponsoring that party. That, uh, that band was something else. I don't know about that harmonica player, though. But uh, they, they were, maybe some of the people that were there last night uh, are not here, if you know what I mean. It's early. It was a good time. Uh, so we, we will also thank our sponsor, uh, Media Venture Partners, uh, for hosting this morning's breakfast. Clayton Funk would have been here, but he had to uh, run out of town earlier than he had expected. Um, Clayton and Media Venture Partners were in this business from the very beginning uh, of the, the tower business, and they always saw the value in a shared infrastructure model. And they're big believers in, in small cells and DAS now. They see that as the next sort of tower model, and that's really uh, appropriate for them to be the, um, for them to be the host of this because Mark uh, Gansey, as we know, uh, is looking at it the same way. Uh, Mark is a, a great guy. You know, Clayton Funk has made a lot of people very, very wealthy in this room, <laughs> helping to do those transactions, and Media Venture Partners has done that. And uh, speaking of which, uh, we have Mark, who is doing pretty well. He has a special place in my heart. Uh, he was the chairman of PCIA when I was hired. So he essentially hired me um, and uh, hasn't fired me yet. And he's still a great leader on the board of PCIA and, and, and a real um, industry visionary. You know, I, obviously I have to say nice things about him, but even if I didn't have to, I would because really have um, a, a special feeling about Mark. He's really seen around the corner time and time again. Uh, he is a special voice in our industry, somebody who can explain it um, both inside and outside. And he's got the Midas touch. Every venture he's involved with turns to gold, from Apex Site Management to Spectrosite to Global Teller Partners, which he was able to, to sell for $4.8 billion. He hits it out of the park every time. And this is no series of accidents. He really is a visionary. He gets it. He gets it usually before everyone else. And he's kind enough to share his vision to help the entire industry move forward. He's done that time and again. So when he decides to invest a, a billion in Exonet, to paraphrase E.F. Hutton, people listen. It's a good sign for all of us in this business that Mark is uh, making his bet on the, on the het net, and he'll let us know what his thinking is about it. We'll all be at the edge of our seats to hear his insight, so please give a warm head net welcome to Mark Ganzi. Thanks, Jonathan. So I don't know if this mic is on. Oh, it is on, good. I hate sitting by a podium, for those of you that know me. Um, but uh, thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, way too gracious of you. And uh, the best thing that we ever did at PCIA, um, far better than a lot of the legislative gains that we've made, was hiring Jonathan Adelstein. He's really put us in a, in a very unique position uh, in the, on the Hill and uh, in the telecommunications industry. Um, I've been a member of PCIA for 21 years. And really, the last four years has been sort of the watershed years for our trade association. And I think Jonathan has done an incredible job taking us forward. And so kudos to you, Jonathan. Big round of applause for, for Jonathan Adelstein. Um, I'm, I'm flattered by Jonathan's remarks, um, humbled to be here. And um, you know, when they asked me to come speak, they said, well, what, you know, what, what could you offer to the industry? And I thought it would be um, good for us to think about a few things. One, that everything I say up here cannot be used against me in a court of law. So just be made aware of that very quickly. Um, you all read that, right? Of course. So anyway, there's, there's a couple things I wanted to share today that I think would be relevant for the dialogue and the things that are going on in our industry today. Um, first, I want to give you a quick overview of who we are. I think there's been a lot of mystery in the industry about what we're doing and, and, and how we're spending our time and where we're, we're putting our energy today. The second thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is just the current state of communications infrastructure. And that has really developed into a legitimate asset class. And so I want to give some shape around that and uh, help, help frame it for you. Then I want to talk about the drivers, the things that are really fundamentally driving capital expenditures by the carriers and, and you know, where do we see the future of networks going and where do we see consumer behavior going. Because that fundamentally, that's what drives the spending. 
Um, then I'll give you sort of our take on small cell. You know, why did we make a billion dollar investment? We actually raised 1.5 billion to put into Extinet. So part of it was buying Extinet. That was half the equation. The other half of the equation is to continue to invest with our carrier partners uh, in the small cell space. And then last but not least, just really sort of finish off with talking about what we feel is next. Um, and from our perspective, uh, there's, there's a lot of, it's sort of an overused word, convergence, but really when you think about where networks are going today, it's, it's not a cliche. This is something you really need to be thinking about and we'll share with you some of the thoughts that we're thinking about and how we see network elements coming together. So very quickly, I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is not a digital bridge informational uh, session, but what are we? Um, we're a communications infrastructure platform. We're solely focused on investing in communications infrastructure. Um, my partner, Ben Jenkins, and I founded this business with our own money. Um, you know, every investment that we make, we make significant personal investments in, and we back rate management teams, and this is what we do. So this is a little bit of our team. This is our investment team. See any of these guys running around, run away from them. Um, means they want to buy something from you. And so what does that mean? I think when we think about it, you know, we talk a lot about active management and we don't make passive investments. We're not a private equity fund. Um, you know, we're, we're not a hedge fund. You know, we are builders of businesses. That's what we do. That's what I've been doing for 21 years. That's what I will do for the next 21 years of my life. And so from our perspective, to do that successfully, you've got to, in this industry, you've got to have strong balance sheet management. You've got to find the best management teams, help them, augment them, work with them. You've got to be able to buy assets. M&A is an important component of what we do. Um, you've got to have the ability to operate the assets. And then you've got to use IT back office technology to drive efficiencies. One of the beautiful things about this business that we like is its operating margins. And the only way you achieve great operating margins is through efficiency. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about these things. Capital, people, M&A, systems, processes, and uh, procedures. So what, what have we done so far? A digital Bridge was started about 18 months ago. Um, we've raised about 3.6 billion. We've put all of that capital to work in these distinct five businesses so far. Our first four investments were in the tower industry. Uh, our biggest first investment was uh, MTP, Mexico Tower Partners. Second was Vertical Bridge, which is uh, really sort of a, a reincarnation of the uh, GTP management team back in U.S. Towers. That's a REIT, a private REIT. Um, we're a, uh, a significant minor, minority shareholder in the largest private tower company in China. Very interesting place. Um, our nearest competitor, just to frame this properly for you, we own about 500 towers. Our nearest competitor... Uh, the next guy up owns 900,000 towers. It's called the National Tower Company. Um, so big, big difference between Tower Co. 1 and Tower Co. 2. So we've got to close that gap. We've got a lot of work to do there. Uh, Andean Tower Partners is our new business in Colombia and Peru. It's really an extension of what we've done in MTP, where we're building for our same customers down there. And then our latest investment, of course, is Exonet, which is our entrance into the fiber and small cell space. So current state of communications infra. I'm really trying to coin this com infra thing. I think I'm, I've got a patent pending on this, so we'll see if it, what happens, Jonathan. But the current state of play is pretty simple. Um, we're in a really unique and interesting sector. And when we think about that ecosystem, when we think about the different components of delivery of bandwidth, these are the things that we spend our time thinking about. So we think about towers. We think about small cell. We think about Wi-Fi. We think about fiber, backhaul, data centers, and we talk about data centers, we talk about co-location services, and we talk about cloud and managed services. These are really all of the components of the delivery of bandwidth today. And what we find today is that all of these components are working in concert together. And we find that all of these businesses actually have very similar characteristics. Um, so when we also look at this, we say, all five of these assets today are not only growing, but you see a significant amount of capital inflow into all of these verticals. And there's very few industries in the world where you see an ecosystem like this where capital is, is funneling into all of these silos at the same time. Now there's different degrees of inflows into this industry. I tried to sort of parse them out for you very quickly because I don't have a lot of time, I've been told. But when we think about this, 
I think about capital inflows, there's public capital inflows, there's private capital inflows, and then there's the debt markets. Those are the three things that we think about. We, we think about where investors can put their money to work. And so when we think about where private capital is going today, there's a lot of private capital very interested in this room. Private equity is very interested in small cell. Private equity firms really don't understand the business yet, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of capital uh, interested in putting money to work in this room. In addition to that, we see that there's private capital going into data centers and fiber, particularly data centers. I don't know those of you that are reading what's going on in the data center world, but the data center business is going through an M&A renaissance similar to where the tower industry was in sort of 2005, 6, and 7. Significant consolidation and a lot going on there. And then we think about fiber to the cell site. I think everyone has seen what's gone on, what, what they've done out in Boulder with Zayo. Uh, that's been an incredible story, what Dan Caruso's built out there. But there's a ton of other companies out there that compete against Dan. And there's a lot of private capital chasing into the fiber business, fiber to the small cell. And that business model is evolving and changing as well. Where we do see capital, where we see private equity money moving away today is towers. That is an asset class that has lost favor with private equity investors. And the reason to that is really the tower, the macro tower business is reaching a level of maturation. The ability to buy assets, the ability to build assets, investors are now looking at these models and seeing, you know, middle to high single digit returns. And that's not really a private equity model anymore. And a lot of that is a function of the fact that it's very competitive. Carriers have put tremendous pressure on tower companies. Rents are coming down. M&A multiples have gone up. And it's really become a business about he who has the lowest cost of, cop cost of capital can win. So that's one asset class that's fallen out, of, fallen out of favor. What's interesting about all five of these verticals is debt capital is flowing into all of them at the same time. You see Wi-Fi companies getting senior credit facilities done, data centers getting CMBS and ABS passed. SBA just launched an ABS product last week in the CMBS market. And then you see multiple financings on the data center guys right now. So, Debt capital plentiful, leverage levels are still holding, pricing is still pretty tight. If you looked at what SBA's notes priced at inside of 3%, if there's any sort of you know, belief that the credit cycle is moving away from us and interest rates and spreads are moving away from us, I think the SBA securitization showed us that there is a flight to quality. Bond investors will pay a lower coupon if they believe that there is a better asset to chase. Very few good stories to chase in credit land today. This is one of those good stories. Communications infrastructure continues to be a favored asset class. And then last but not least, in the public side, when we think about what's going on in the tower world, you know, American and Crown both are now REITs. SBA is shortly going to be a REIT thereafter. And Vertical Bridge is a REIT. It's good to be a REIT. That's a preferred capital structure issue for those guys. So while the hype, why do we all like communications infrastructure? What's interesting is when you look at all five of those verticals up top, all of them have very similar characteristics from an investment perspective. We like these businesses because one, many of these businesses have very high barriers to entry. Whether you're building a, a proprietary fiber network, whether you have an exclusive DAS system to build in, a, in an, an arena like Staples Center, or you just happen to get that one building permit to build that special 60-foot monopine in Mulholland Drive, what we all like about this business is it has incredible barriers to entry. And once you've made that investment in time to build that facility, traditionally, you can sort of close the zoning door behind you, so to speak. So barriers to entry is really key. The second thing that we love about it is revenue visibility. Our customers will sign long-term leases, fixed escalators. Many of them are investment-grade counterparty credit quality. Um, you know, we like the fact that there is embedded opportunities as our carrier partners expand whether they're taking an additional 50 racks in a co-location facility, whether they've just signed a new contract to add cloud services to their service offering, our customers are growing. Everyone in this room has a customer that's growing. That is a unique industry. We're, we're in a very privileged position, at least that's my perspective. Growth and demand. We'll talk about that in a second, but I don't need to belabor that point to any of you. You all know what's going on in terms of consumer consumption, with respect to wireless devices and those products. And last but not least, we talked a little bit about this, but we love this business because of operating leverage. It's an incredible business. A lot of these businesses involve fixed assets. And once you've put that fixed asset into place, most of your operating costs are fixed. 
whether you own a, a data center, whether you own a tower in Mexico, whether you own a cloud facility in Brazil, once you've made that initial upfront infrastructure investment, the opportunity for you is to reuse that facility over and over again with multiple customers. And so what initially starts out as a 30 or 40% margin business, eventually can grow to a 60, 70, 80% margin business. Very few industries are left on this planet where you can actually get 80% cash flow margins. This is one of those industries. We're pretty lucky. Moving quickly, because I want to get to the end. The end's more fun. Demand drivers. This is easy. Tracy Ford's looking at me. She's shaking her head. She's like, Mark, we've seen this slide before. I'm just going to keep hammering it, right? It's really simple. Mobile data traffic growth. That's the headline. All driven by consumer behavior. Everyone in this room, our families, our kids, Everyone knows I pick on my daughter Riley all the time when I speak at these conferences. She is the bullseye. She owns three wireless devices and they're all working all day long. Between social media, Netflix, and her school laptop, she's constantly mobile and she's constantly using data. We love Riley. Riley's our favorite person. Um, and so what's happening is as consumers buy better devices and they download with, with more and more information and content, it puts more pressure, as everyone knows in this room, on the network. But we're still a laggard economy, which is shocking to me. It's shocking to me that the US last year passed 100% penetration. We're only at 104% penetration. You look at places like Norway, Korea, Japan, some of those markets have 200% penetration. We believe the US will be north of 200% penetration within five years. 200% penetration within five years. How are we going to get there? So the current demand is all about mobile data. This is sort of the old story. This is the story that we all know. Largely driven by you know, data consumption, 50% CAGR growth over the last five years trailing. These are pretty easy metrics to get your, get your minds around. What's interesting is when you think about these two charts down below, look at the spreading out of devices. So if you look at the fact that we have, you know, Look at 2015 as an example. We've got 7.5 billion devices on the planet today. 68% of those are non-smartphone devices. So the majority of the globe is not using a smartphone or a connected device yet or a tablet. Right? So where are we? We're early innings. We're early innings in terms of consumer uptake and in terms of consumption of wireless data. And then if you think about, if you take that one over and you say, okay, well, how are we consuming it? So if we know that only 32% is smartphones or connected devices, and then you look at where the actual consumption is, 91% of that consumption is coming from 32% of the devices. Pretty incredible. So the high-end users are sucking all the bandwidth. But that's going to change. We get the spreading out effect as more people do sign on to smartphones and connected devices. So here's the slide we've all seen, right? Mobile data traffic, you know, growing at 61%, 50% CAGR growth over the last, you know, projected over the next, uh, I think, two or three more years. This is an incredible on-ramp. And we're not measuring stuff in terabytes. We're talking about measuring stuff in exabytes. So we've, once again, we've moved the yardsticks, right? We, we, got, we, we, we picked up that first down, and they've already moved the yardsticks. We're going this way. So what do we think is next? We talked about how do you get to 200% penetration. Well, we don't get to 200% penetration by everyone carrying two iPhones. That's not how we get there. So we think you get there through a variety of different components to the ecosystem. One is this concept of wearables. I mean, how many in, how many in this room have a wearable? Put your hand up. Who has a wearable? Anyone? Wow, that's, that's pretty small. Usually in a room, I get more than that. So wearables are growing really fast. Um, we all know that those are fitness bands. You could actually call the, the iWatch a, a, a wearable to a certain degree. But this is a big emerging area, a lot of growth in wearables. We see that as very sustainable for the next five years. The other thing that we see is what we call M to M connections. So this is machine to machine. By the way, that's an old acronym. Who knows the new acronym? IOT, thank you. That was really fast. So IOT. Um, so for the first time, we're actually we now have three MLAs going with three, two new IoT customers. And some of you are service providers in this room that are building sites for those guys and doing site act for them. IoT is real. It's not just Exelon and Baltimore Gas and Electric and Progress and Duke 
doing smart grid, these are carriers that are actually very focused on the consumer delivery of the Internet of Things. And we haven't even been able to qualify how many sites that is. In fact, when we think about our site counts, when we started all these businesses 18 months ago, these IoT carriers weren't even in our demand numbers. This is gravy. But IoT is here. It's real. It's everything from consumer intelligence gathering, weather gathering, traffic pattern gathering, smart cities, smart grids, smart energy, consumer consumption. All of these things are real. They're relevant. And there's real capital going into these businesses. And they're very well funded. The three carriers that we're talking to that we're developing MLAs with at our tower business right now, those three companies together have already raised a billion and a half dollars. That's real CapEx. That's real network infrastructure spending. IoT is here. It's real. So we're very focused on that. The third trend that we see besides wearables and IoT is video. Video is what kills the network. If you think about what happens to a cell site in the suburbs today between the hours of 5.30 and 9.30, all you need to talk to is a head of RF engineering at any of the four major carriers, and they'll tell you what's killing the network. It's downloads, it's live streaming music, it's Netflix. This is where the network is getting congested and it's getting pinched. And it really, the, the solution to that, we're going to talk about that in a second, really resides in this room, we think. So, if, if we really did nothing, right, just assume for a second we're in this magical world where we do nothing and we assume that we have great spectrum and we have perfect radios and we just keep building cell sites until the cows come home. So in 2012, we had just a little under 300,000 cell sites. We're going to end this year as a market with 360,000 cell sites. So we will have in 13, 14, and 2015, we will have built an additional 60,000 cell sites. If we do nothing, we would have to build 4.3 million cell sites to make networks work at the current consumer demand behavior trends. That's how many cell sites we'd have to build. This assumes no changes. No changes in spectrum, no changes in radios. You just have to go out and keep building sites. Well, we all know in this room that doesn't work. So what are the solutions? The solutions are pretty simple. One, we need more spectrum. I think, Jonathan, we have 220 megahertz of new spectrum coming in the next, I think, two to three years between the AWS3 and the rebroadcasting spectrum. That's a lot of spectrum. That's more spectrum than we've had come to market in probably two decades. So 220 megahertz coming to market in the next three years. We need it. We need it fast. Um, despite what you hear the carriers saying publicly, of jockeying about, oh, we're not going to bid on any spectrum. Trust me, they're all going to bid on spectrum. They all need it. Second, we need spectral efficiency. This actually, to me, may be the most important thing that has to happen in the next five years. As we make our transition from 4G to 5G, and we eventually settle on a standard, which is happening right now, this is where the battle is going to be won and lost, is in spectral efficiency. So we're moving from LTE to LTE plus to 5G. And really what that means is, from our perspective, is you need efficiency in radios, you need efficiency in battery life, and you need efficiency in the devices. You need all three of those components of infrastructure to improve. And then last, thankfully, we need new sites. Thank God for more sites. We need more macro sites, we need small cells, we need DAS, and we need more Wi-Fi offload. All of these things have to happen. As I like to say, there's not a single bullet that solves this problem. So, moving along, I think I'm doing okay on time, Jonathan. Okay. Our take on